What is this? Your, I'm in your top 2,700 now, or what, what, which, which, which interview is this? 2,697, yeah. We, we, we've been okay, here. I'm only three short of the 2,700 mark. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I am so excited for this. I had so many great things from Niv and Moshi at Shrug, so thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be here, Harry. It's uh, fantastic Acro across, across the seas. Across the pond. Listen, I was listening to your fantastic talk. At, I think it was a Goldman event, and you were talking about rocking up to Duke for your first day with nothing but a green duffel bag. And so I wanted to start on that. Tell me about that moment, and just take me there, because I love that story. Oh, that seems like yesterday. It's a long time ago, but it was a very sunny day. I, I'd never been to Duke University, and I was amazed when we pulled up. I had uh, offered to load up a truck, a moving van with furniture. I'd, I'd worked there in the summer. And they said they would give me a ride to college. So we loaded up the truck, uh, 45 for the truck, all sorts of furniture. And the very last thing was my one duffel bag. That was 100% of what I owned at the, at the time. I think I had a lamp in there and, and three pairs of jeans and, and the top kit and a green duffel bag, army duffel bag. And so we pulled up to Duke and all these people were pulling up. My, my, my family had moved to Tokyo, so I was kind of on my own. He opened up the back of the truck and people were staring at us. It was a 45-foot van and I pulled my duffel bag out and I looked around and I said, I'll get the rest of the stuff later. And uh, I proceeded down to the dorm. So so that was my, my, my grand entry into Duke on a moving event. Can I be really um, intrusive and ask you, I've, I've had situations like that before and I felt out of place. I felt like maybe I didn't belong. D did you at that moment, and, and how was that for you as a student when there were the wealthy students taking all their things out and you, you were saying, I'll, I'll pick it up later? Oh, you know, I, I thought it was just funny. I, 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 I don't really judge anybody. And I had a very good, good upbringing and, and uh, great, great parents. And so it was just another day in life, basically. Can I ask, when you look back to like those days in your early days, did you, did you always believe that you would be a success? Did you know that, you may not know in how, but did you know that you would be a success? Well, it's not, it's not clear that I'm a success yet. So I, I think that's only measured, you know, probably when you're, when you're gone. And it's probably measured by the people who who who, uh, who you impacted. But I would say that my my mother was very fundamental uh, influence on me, and she always had a, a big belief in me. She she believed I could do anything, and and, and that's a great lesson learned. Uh, she gave me a lot of confidence. So I didn't know I'd, I'd be successful, but I thought I had a chance. And and they got me a great education, and and uh, and and she was always supportive to the day she died in everything that I was doing, whether it was Bain Capital or charity events or or, or anything like that. So it's it's great to have a mother like that. Did she impact how you think about parenting with your children? Yeah, absolutely. Both my parents did. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's a crazy business of investing, as you know, as yeah. you are an investor. Things don't always don't go to plan and, and you have to be certain places and be all over the place. But I think the major thing I try to do well, is, is, is is get back on the weekends, at least. And, and I'm, I'm most proud of the fact that I think I've been to almost every 99% of uh, my, my children, four children, basketball games, soccer games, uh, hockey games, school plays. Um, I've, I have a great track record of that. And I've actually coached over 100 teams that they've been on. So so you really have to make it you know, a priority and be there. I think I could have done better looking back because you get wrapped up in this crazy deal world. But, uh, but, but I've tried very hard. I did have this, you know, beautifully crafted schedule, but I'm too fascinated. I struggle with that work-life balance. And I always say when you're doing well at work, you're doing terribly at home. And when you're doing well at home, you're doing badly at work. Do you agree with that? Or would you say, actually, that's... You know, I remember I remember uh, vividly my first day at, uh, at Harvard Business School. They had Jack Welsh come in, who was the famous CEO at that time, GE. I think he'd been CEO for, for, for one year. They asked him the same question you're asking. And what advice would you give the graduates? And he said, you know, really spend time with your family. Um, yeah, I really, I, I really, and then, and then he went on to say he regretted that he hadn't done enough. So, so, so we've all given the speech. Uh, and the question is, you got to, you kind of try it really hard to make it reality. So I agree with you. You can just get wrapped up and in the deal business, it's all encompassing and, and helping lots of people, but you got to make it a priority. You said very humbly, and you know, Niv and Moshe both told me how humble you are. Um, and, and she said it, Matt, at Bain. But you, you said very humbly, you don't know if you're a success yet. Um, my, my question to you is, we all have big breaks in careers, or we hope for them. When you look back at your incredible career, what would you say was your, your really big break? Well, clearly my biggest break was uh, in the summer of uh, 1981, I applied for a, a summer job at Bain & Company the consulting firm at the time. There was no Bain Capital at the time. And uh, I did that because I was actually getting a, trying to get a, a doctorate in economics at Harvard. Uh, 
I was going to try to be a teacher, so, so I, but I couldn't afford it. So I, I needed to get a summer job. I looked down the list, and the highest paying job was was Bain and Company. I didn't even know what it what it did. Um, so I did the interviews, and they were they were great people, and they hired me for the summer, and that was really transformational for me because I was kind of off the turnip truck. I've been a furniture mover. I've been an accountant, um, and and I, and I, I came to to, to to Harvard with with, with that. Um, but the folks at Bain really opened my eyes to business transformation. Uh, the latest techniques that back then it was very exciting, the experience curve, growth share matrix. Um, and so I, I, I really had a fantastic summer and they convinced me uh, to come back and said they would help fund my, my doctoral program later. I could work there for three or four years and then go back and get a doctorate and just get the MBA. And so I accepted that offer. So that was very transformational for me. And, and I had two fantastic bosses uh, who are still mentoring me today, Harry Strack and Mike D'Amato. So I feel very blessed. They taught taught me all the ropes, and I, I still call them today when there's a really important problem or question. I still call both of them and say, you know, what do you think about this? Because they were credible mentors. Can I ask you? You mentioned Harry and Mike there. I, I have some incredible mentors too. Uh, if you were to say there's like one or two things that stuck with you from their mentorship, is there any that ring true? And what I mean by that is like you know, one of my mentors is Michael Mark Evans. He once told me, "You're never wrong to do the right thing." So whenever I have a decision, I always think, "What's the right thing?" And even if it's hard, I'll do it. Are there any one or two takeaways that you really remember from Harry and Mike? The main things I remember from both of them is 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 they were they were um, critical but not judgmental. So they had that same quality of I knew they wanted me to succeed, and even when I uh, messed some things up, you know they would they would they would uh, kind of kind of criticize it in the right way, saying you know. You meant to do this, but you did this, and and uh, other, just the the way about them. I mean, Mike D'Amato always used to say, "Well, you could be perceived as as being too aggressive in a certain thing." So it was, wasn't that you really were too aggressive? You were perceived. Uh, he used the word "perceived" a lot. Um, so so it was more their, their 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 kind of confidence in you and the way they they handled uh, making you a better person and 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 really giving you that constructive feedback. I mean, that is a man of elegance and elan. That is just beautifully put. Now, I think that what I love so much about, you know, your history and your success is actually the integration of sport and business. And so a question that I wanted to ask as we enter the business discussion is when we think about high performance, what does that mean to you when I say the words high performance? I don't want to digress, but one other thought came to mind out of that question. Um, the, the, the Harry Strachan said to me, and this is like your mentor, he, he said to me, the one thing you really have to learn about it is that all the world's a stage, uh, and 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 I, I've given that advice to, to generations of Bain Capital people. People judge you by how you how you treat other people. So when people come in and and and, and talk to your assistant and they don't talk to them in a, in a great way, you know people are watching that. So I advise all of my mentees that they have to carry themselves in 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 with respect and in the appropriate ways with people. Because all the world's a stage, and that comes from from your side of the pond, William Shakespeare. I I, I love that. Can I ask you? As you, I'm sorry, we'll come back to the performance stuff. Um, as you became more and more successful, how did you not gain an ego? How did you retain humility? I think it's easy to say and difficult to do. It's something I've struggled with over the years. Um, how how did you do that? Well, I, I you know, look, I have an ego just as any of us. You can't be successful in this business without an ego. So so uh. uh but but I would say that my grandfather was a was a was a shoemaker. Uh, he made eight dollars a week, and you know came out and worked on our yard, uh, worked with my father. So I grew up in a in kind of an Italian family, immigrant family, and I don't I don't think I've kind of ever left that mentality. They had a depression mentality. The reason I I was an accountant was because my father and grandfather said you have to be an accountant when you go to school, and I didn't like accounting. Um, because they were the only people employed during the Depression. So every year of my life, uh, probably until they died, they thought the Depression was coming. They, 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 they thought the Depression was right around the corner, but I would be employed because I was an accountant. So when you come from that background, I, I, I think it's, 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 it's hard to, uh, to kind of think you're better than everybody else. And I, you know, I've always viewed the world, it's a world of opportunity. And, there, every, every, and Harry told me the same thing. There are so many smart people out there that they're, they're just as smart as we are, but we've just had we've just had opportunities and serendipity and, and luck. And I think the Bain culture, the Bain and Company culture, when I came to Bain and Company, 
we always treated the clients, Bill Bain always said, you need to treat the clients with great respect. Uh, from the person who opens the door all the way to the CEO, you got to be very respectful of the clients. So, so that that kind of kind of I think ethic has stuck, and even even translated over to Bain Capital, it's it's a lower key, uh, people oriented uh, private equity firm. You mentioned that mentality, seeing your grandfather, you know, making eight dollars a week, and you know, working with your father. You know, my, my family lost everything when I was young. And it really shaped my mindset on safety and security to the extent that I think it negatively impacted how I ran the media company because I didn't invest in it. I took cash off the table because, you you know, safety for your family is everything. And that was the most important thing. But it was a mistake. And I still have trouble today investing in the business because that's dollars out of my family's pocket. <laughs> um did you have that downside protectionist mindset? Yes, yes. I, 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 we're, we're two peas in a pod in that uh, that respect. So I, I struggle so, so, sometimes to spend money <laughs> because it, it, yeah, it's just it, it's highly ingrained that the you really got to feed your family and you got to be secure. That that definitely has impacted my life. <laughs> but then you buy sports teams, Steve. Like, help me understand that juxtaposition. Well, that 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 that's that's an investment. You know, that was a labor of love. There was a, a community asset, the Celtics, and they weren't doing that well. And Wick Grosbeck, who was a good friend, called me and said, uh, you know, he had a, he had a line into buying the Celtics. Would I like to be his partner? And I've been a lifelong basketball fan and sports fan, and, and all all of sports. And so I thought that was a potential dream come true. And I did. I did struggle with the decision. I, I I talked to my wife Judy and and said, you know, should we do this? You know, should should we should we should we invest in this team? And uh, I decided I was passionate about it. That I that I overcame that fear and I invested in the team. And it's one of the best things I've ever done. It's just been been a fantastic run. It's been twenty years now. I, I, you know, I, I spoke to a mentor the other day, and he said you should when you have allocation decisions like this, you should spend time with your CFO, with your accounting team, really analyze it. And then you should go home to your wife and whatever she says you should do. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but I, I love that. You mentioned the Celtics there. You know, speaking of uh, going back to what we said, high performance. What does high performance mean to you, both with the business and the sports mindset hat on? High performance means, uh, you know, leaving it all out of the field, as they say, doing the best you possibly can, going the extra mile. The high performance teams at Bain, at the Celtics, the teams we've had, they look at every detail. If if you ask them for a, you know a two slide presentation, they bring you a five slide presentation. High performance teams go above and beyond. So, if high performance teams go above and beyond, when we look at your investing track record, it is one of you know the best tracks. Um, and so, I wanted to ask: when you think about your investing style today, this could be in sport where it's passion and investment led. It could be purely when you think about investing. But how would you analyze or describe your investing style today? Well, investing style today is it, it's 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 a it's always a balancing act between the facts and you know coming from from Bain and Company and Bain Capital, the whole ethos of Bain Capital and Bain Company is is fact based analysis. Out analyze every, every look over every every stone, figure out the markets, figure out the market share, uh, build incredible models. It's, it's just it's just it's just a fantastic way of investing. You know, you know, really really deep due diligence, uh, primary customer research. And then the other side of it is 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 the people side. You know, who are the people running the business? Do you trust them? What what is their passion? What are they trying to accomplish? You make investments decision both on the facts, but just as importantly, the people involved that have to drive it forward. And so that's been our style to look at both of those aspects uh, over time. Can I ask you on people? It, <laughs> I'm I'm literally using this as a counseling and a learning session. So you should invoice me afterwards. Um, would you start with? full trust or do you start with no trust and it's there to be gained i'm a believer in people so i believe in the full trust model until until proved different proved, until it's proved wrong and and most people are very trustworthy but in the due diligence uh, you, you know it's it's always great to uh, meet somebody personally but you got to get references and and so we do a lot of work in in uh, in, in checking out you know management teams and and one of their values and who are they really as people that sometimes is, is missed, that, that little depth is missed on investments, and you really need to get that right. Certainly learn that over time. Niv and Moshi said I had to ask this, but you mentioned the people and you mentioned the diligence there. With the excess supply of capital that we saw you know, in 2022 and 2021 in particular, we saw not that much diligence done, but quite a lot of capital flowing into some companies. Uh, Niv and Moshi asked, 
what do you think will happen to these companies that have very little to show but huge balance sheets and huge valuations? Well, you know, we've seen this. Uh, um, I, I've been doing this for close to four decades now, and you know, the, the crash of '87, the '99, you know, tech crash, the internet back back in those days, the financial crisis, um, and it just seems like the world goes through periods of exuberance and then you know per periods of doom, and we certainly had an exuberant period here where the model was slipped on its its head, uh, and in fact, it worked. It worked in several cases. A company like Amazon lost money for years and years and years until it made a lot of money. But then in capitalism, sometimes there's that, that over-exuberance and irrational behavior to say, okay, every company can do that. And we basically have come out from a phase of, of, of that happening for probably the last you know 10 or so years. Um, and it reminded me back in 99, in 99 uh, uh, with the internet, people would come in with a term sheet and say, uh, you have you have a day to decide. Here's our terms, and we're going to the other people. So you have 24 hours to decide. And and many venture firms backed companies like that. Some were successful, but most weren't. And there were a few few winners. So we're really coming out of a period now where uh, over a long period of time, because of low interest rates, because of the success of the, of some of the unicorns, Amazon and Alibaba, there was an investment mentality that said we can lose lots of money forever, and there'll be a pot of gold in the other rainbow. Unfortunately, that is for a very few specific circumstances. There are not that many unicorns that will be created. And so now you're seeing a lot of companies that have to go back to basics and figure out how to deliver profits or have a plan that will deliver profits. There's just been a lot of overinvestment in that philosophy saying a hoard of cash and buying market share can get you a great business at the end. And, and that is just not true for 90% of the businesses. Steve, you mentioned the four decades that you've kind of uh, invested and lived through. Um, and my question to you is, how does this compare? Is this as bad as the media seem? I think we have a tendency to dramatize, especially if we haven't seen it before. You know, me, the, your nibs and moshies as well. We've never invested through a crash. Like, how does this compare? The positive side of this is this is all equity dollars mainly invested. The, where you go to a real problem, the crash of 2008 was, you know, based on on just too much leverage everywhere. When that leverage gets pulled out, you have a crisis. Equity dollars are just lost. You're not loaning it to, to somebody else. You just lose your equity dollars. So there'll be a carnage of, of, of some firms that uh, you know overinvested in this over-exuberance. But uh, that will not move the needle like the crash did in, in 2008 because that was driven by you know, debt, which has a multiplier effect. You mentioned Amazon, Alibaba that. I'm intrigued from your perspective. I think you learn a lot investing-wise from your biggest wins and also your biggest misses. When you think about your biggest win, what, what is it? And what, how did that change your investing mindset? You know, I, 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 I'd be like picking one of your children. I've had, I've had several you know, great, and it depends on how you measure a biggest win. Is it, is it uh, the growth of the company? Is it, is it the deliver the most profits on a, on a large investment or a small investment? But one investment that I'm very fond of, and I'm still involved with today, uh, it was actually this. I think the second or third investment I did in my in my career in 1991 is called the Gartner Group, and you you may know it. It's a it's an information services company. It's, it provides um, data about technology and which technology you should buy and how they work. And back in 1991, that was a, a kind of 50 60 million dollar sales company. It was owned by an advertising agency in the UK, Saatchi and Saatchi, yeah. a non core business, and it was losing money. And they had their own issues, so they had to sell it. And uh, 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 we we actually came in and information partners, bank capital, and, and and bought the company with the management team. Today, that company has it's it's basically gone from a seventy. I think we bought it for seventy million. It's worth over twenty billion today. And I'm still I'm still on the board. So it's been an incredible incredible run. It's had uh, it's had three great CEOs over that period. And because technology has grown, the, 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 the need for technology information has grown, and they've had a great culture, a great management team, but basically built that business from, from uh, 70 million in sales to uh, you know, multiple billions now at, and, and, uh, and at over 20 billion market cap. I'm ashamed to say I did not know it was a Saatchi and Saatchi business. My mother's first job was at Saatchi and Saatchi, so I hope she's not listening. Um, but uh, my question to you is, how did that shape your, your mindset on investing? Well, it really taught me that... Uh, um, there's huge value to investing in companies that have a growth path. Our thesis in investing into Gartner was that technology was going to get more and more complicated, that people would need more information before they bought computers and they bought software. 
And at the time, the company was mainly selling to a few companies in in, in the New York or New England area. We thought it could ex- expand globally. We thought it should have thousands of Salesforce people instead of the few few uh, 25 that they had. And so that that thesis panned out. There's a misnomer about private equity because I think way back when, in this, when it first started in the 70s, it wasn't called private equity. It was called leverage buyouts. Uh, a lot of those deals were taking companies that had uh, generous pension programs and were too, way, too, way, way too fat companies that had jets and cost reducing. And so the, there was a mental model that, that, that that's what private equity was. Actually, it's, it's really hard to do that because companies are well run today and have been well run you know, since, since the 80s. And really where you, where you do well in private equity is you identify growth opportunities. So Bain Capital has been highly focused you know, for the last 30 years on, on can we build and grow companies and can the company be different 10 years from now than it is today? Can it, can it uh, uh, develop new products? Can it go to Europe? Can it go to China? Can you expand it? And the next investor, the public or whoever buys the company from you, they're looking for growth. So you can't just come in and, ha- and cut costs out and, and cut benefits and then, and then actually make money in the investment because people don't want something that, that is, is declining in sales. So the lesson I learned from Gartner very early on is, is uh, if you can find a growth opportunity that's very valuable and look for growth companies. So I focused on technology and medical, both of which been has been growth areas for the last 40 years. Does that focus not change with macro cycles and sentiment? And what I mean by that is like now we're seeing a much bigger focus on profitability, capital efficiency within organizations, and less of a concern about your level of growth rate. Does that hold true across market cycles, that focus on growth, or is it cyclical? It, it, it does hold true. Uh, so, so I think the trend you're talking about is we're moving, people are moving away for, for companies will require losses of big capital investment losses for you know seven or ten years, a la the the Amazon model, the weight of money model. They're moving away from that. Uh, but once you move away from that, you still want a company that's going to grow the top line because that's where the value is created. Uh, that you, you you want a long term grower. So I think table stakes now are going to be companies have to have a clear plan. For profitability, what profitability really communicates is is that you have a good product that someone is willing to give you a fair profit on. But then within that, the ones that are going to win are the ones that can grow for a long period of time. Yeah, I also think people forget the value of compounding. You know, growing forty percent a year when you're at ten million in ten years, that's a big, so big comes out to be a big number. Yeah, it's a big number. And on the flip side. We all have made mistakes investing. I certainly have done. Um, tell me, what's been your single biggest like investment loss, and and how did that change your mindset? Because I feel that really changed mine. Uh, you, uh, you know, I invested in a company back around the period, of, maybe a little after Gartner, called PQC, which was was Physicians Quality Care. We had done a study and and found that there was a market developing where physicians would band together and you could deliver a better service and better quality to patients. If you centralize the equipment and the x-ray equipment you needed, if you centralize purchasing, the, the physicians would do better and the patients would do better and you could schedule that with software use. So the, the, the economy of scale of putting physicians together was, I thought, a great, a great idea. We thought a great idea. We did a white paper on it and we found a group in, uh, in Baltimore to, to invest behind um, that looked very promising. But it turned out back in the day, whatever that was, 1992 or 93, they really couldn't work together. They, they, they couldn't uh, uh, centralize things. The software wasn't there to, to make it happen. And so we, 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 it was basically a venture, venture investment gone bad. What I learned from that is it's, it, was a, it was a great idea, but it was ahead of its time and it was really hard to execute that idea. In fact, 20, 30, 20, 30 years later, now there are large doctor you know, good collaborators. All, all the things that were in that paper are true. It just took another 20 years you know, for, for the technology and the infrastructure be there for it to happen. Um, so it was an idea ahead of its time. Do you really think about market timing now when making investments? I wouldn't call it market timing. I, I would call I would call it um, stepping back and, and saying, you know, what is the macro trend? What's the macro trend? And bank capital, we've always been micro economists. Take a business and what can we do with the business and and, and how can we change it for the positive? Um, and I think we've learned in in the last twenty years, we've been much more looking at okay. That's what we can do for a micro basis, but what's going to be the macro effect upon it? I totally agree. And I, I almost think actually some of the best venture investors are both macro and micro economists at the same time when I reflect on some of the interviews. Absolutely. I've, 
Um, can, can I ask you, when we think about, like, Bane itself, when you think about one or two of the elements that made Bane so successful over such a long period of time, what do you think are the one or two elements that made Bane so successful with reflection? Well, I, I think the first element was the idea of taking the consulting skills developed at Bain and Company and applying that to uh, actually actually owning the businesses. Bain and Company had been a very successful consulting firm, growing great businesses and great clients in, in, in globally. And the idea that Bill Bain had was, well, if we could own those companies, we could do that even faster and better and, put, and, and help them with these analytic resources. We're, we're a huge tool to these companies. And it turns out that you know that, that philosophy worked really, really well. In fact, most of the industry is adopting that now. They hire Bain and Company and McKinsey to do what we do set internally at, at, at Bain Capital. Um, the second uh, piece, piece, uh, critical piece was alignment with investors. So when Bain Capital was formed, most of the a lot of the investment came in from the Bain partners, the people themselves, and we've done, we've really held firm to that today. Where uh, let's say our, our last twelve billion dollar fund, over a billion of capital, has come from all the people in the company, and that and that is uh, you know a hundred times more in terms of percentage than most of, of the of the investor firms out there. So so high alignment with our investors was was a, was a second a second aspect of it. And then I think I think a third aspect was was really uh, working in a team environment as we had in consulting. So so we've developed a global team network that can apply these resources you know globally um, at moments notice to to help any business. So those three things I think have, have propelled the success of Bank Up. I, I I love those in terms of those three segments. Uh, I, all things are great are done in threes. I find um, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so if that's what like was critical to the success, if you had a magic wand and you could change a couple of elements that you did, strategic decisions, what would you change that you think negatively impacted the course or trajectory of Bain? Oh, I, I, I think course has been been uh, uh, a great course. So, so, so uh, what I think we maybe could have done is is applied the model earlier globally. You know, we recognize the value of a global network, and we and and I think in the uh, Bain Capital started in '84. And we really didn't take the model globally until 2000 or so, where we opened up in in uh, in, in London. So we, we formed an office in London, uh, the whole group over. And I, I was involved in that. I got an apartment in London, and it was very exciting times. We thought the model of improving companies and building companies would apply to other ge geographic areas, and it turns out it did. I think we could have done it earlier, and it turns out that that global network is a great competitive advantage because. Uh, you can have expertise in in Europe and industrial chemicals, and we can apply that expertise to a company here in the U.S. Or we have our Asian operations, uh, a company in Asia that wants to sell a product in the U.S. We could we could help them set up with retailers in the U.S. So so the value has been huge of creating that global network. You know, could we have created it earlier? In hindsight, yeah, maybe we could have. You mentioned that global network. I, I heard you say on the GS talk about going from a local business to a mid market buyout and going global. And, you know, when we look at the scaling to, I think it's 160 billion AUM, you'll probably correct me, but roundabout, um, 160 billion AUM. What are the one or two biggest challenges that one faces in scaling a firm to that proportion? It's maintaining the investment discipline and, and, and the culture of the firm. Um, and the way we've done that, we have a, an investment committee that, that basically looks at every investment, whether it's an investment in a company in Rhode Island or a, a company in Malaysia. So we try to maintain that that discipline. And the culture of of really trying to do good investments and build companies and, and have a, have a high performance culture, so that's the thing you've really got to you know keep keep the reins on. You don't want to view yourself as an asset gatherer. Just the, you me, if you measure yourself by the amount of money you put out the door, it, uh, we believe it causes real trouble. You want to measure yourself by the performance and the value that the value that you create investing that money. Can I ask, with the concentrated power of those ICs, does it not mean that they become a bottleneck? When you think about the speed of decisions that need to be made, especially in markets today, you'd be meeting every day for your IC given the size of these vehicles. How do you not be a bottleneck but have that decision-making structure? Well, that's a great question. Uh, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, that involves a, a lot of late-night work and a lot of work. Bain Capital has a huge work ethic. And... Uh, and so I, I would honestly say that we've never lost the deal because of an IC bottleneck. We have a culture of being extremely responsive, extremely creative. And if we need to have an IC at you know two in the morning on on, on uh, Monday morning or, or Sunday night, we will never have a system 
Now, the, the good news is most of those deals that come have already been through their own process in Europe or in Asia. So, so they're pretty fully baked. And so it makes it a very efficient process because it's not starting at square one. Steve, what makes an effective IC and how do you ensure that it feels safe for newer slash younger partners to really share how they feel, to challenge, to champion, to be themselves? That's a really great question. And, and that's something we, we, uh, we really pay a lot of attention to. I, I, think, I think our firm is, is, is really exemplary of that because we foster an active discussion on the key and major issues. The worst thing you can do uh, in investments is politicize it so that you say, well, I don't want to upset that partner because I want to vote for his investment. So we, we kind of hammer that in in, in the culture. And I, I know one investment that, that I brought to committee that I thought we were going to do, I won't mention the name of it, but uh, one of the, one of the uh, actually one of the, one of the principal analysts in the room raised a question about how we were looking at, at the valuation and that if you looked at it on a cash EPS basis versus the EPS basis, it would be shaky. And he was compelling enough that we, we basically shut the whole investment down. And I thought when I walked into that thing, there was about a 90% chance we were going to do it and we didn't do it. And then, and that, that upset a few people on the team. I was on that team because it, it upset me, but, but, uh, but actually it turned out to be a very good decision. And we use that as, as an example to say, you know, the, 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 the uh, speaking up and, and, and saying the right thing, that's what we want you to do. We, and we want dissension. We, we also don't have to have 100% of the people, um, you know, for the investment because you don't want to have a situation where, where one, uh, you know, view, view dictates. But we want those one views because they actually help us also in designing the plan for how you're going to build the company going forward. So, so people that can poke the holes in it, if we're going to still do the investment, it's good to identify those holes and then fix them as soon as you can. Can I ask, do you think disagree and commit works? People often say it. But I find when someone disagrees, they kind of quietly discommit, where they might do it, but they'll do it the day after. They might say they'll do it, but they give it 50% because they never really agreed that it was a good investment. So do you agree disagree and commit works? It, it's worked it's work for us. I, I, I think we, we, uh, we kind of make it, it's, it's like a basketball team. You know, you make decisions, you call a play, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but, but you have to go out there and execute the play. I, I love the sports analogy. It takes me brilliantly to, you know, bluntly, this very important part of sport in your life. When we think about, you know, owning sports teams and then obviously, you know, business building, as we've discussed with Bain, how does it compare when you think about building a sports team and a franchise and compare that to building a business? Like, what's the same? What's different? There's a lot of similarities. One of the similarities is we went into the Celtics. We had a strategic plan. and It, it had three components, as, as you pointed out before. There's always three components in consulting. And... The first component was fundamental to build a championship team because Boston wants championships and, and, and that's how you, how, you, how you drive engagement. The second was to be, we knew it was a community asset and it was to be the best community asset uh, that it could be. And so we formed the Boston Celtic Shamrock Foundation and uh, used the power of sports to actually give millions of dollars to charities and, and kids things. And that that's created a virtuous uh, circle because our fans love the fact that we're supporting uh, kid, kids that need support, and uh, and the and the players go out and go to the hospitals and go to the educational institutions and put in technology centers so they get highly involved. And then the third component of of the plan was to make it a better fan experience. When we uh, purchased the the club, they really didn't have even emails. You know, fan engagement. Uh, there was no internet to speak of at that point, but uh, they weren't engaged with the fans. So we, we wanted to make it a much better fan experience. So we brought in music, we brought in uh, 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 dancing teams, uh, all those kinds of things to make it a better experience for the fans. And in fact, we did win a championship five years later, which is the most important thing. But that's very similar to the investment process where you say there's, there's two or three things you need to do to transform a company to make it a better company five years or 10 years from now than it is today. What's different? The huge difference is that when we're working at Gartner Group or one of the great companies to make them great, we are not under uh, media and radio and television and, and now Twitter and in Instagram scrutiny every five seconds for everything everything that you do. So if you do the slightest thing in a sports team, it, get ma it gets magnified and, and criticized and promoted a, a thousand different ways. So you're really operating under the spotlight. And, 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 the, and I would say if I advise other sports owners, when new owners come in, I say that the worst thing you can do with all due respect to, to, to you, Harry, the media, 
the worst thing you can do is, is run your team based on the media or based on what the media is saying that you should do. And unfortunately, a lot of times people come in and say, okay, we've got to win. We want action. So they'll, they'll pay $20 million for a player who's 35 years old that might have, you know, six months left of, of, of decent play. And they win a few more games, but then the next year, everything go everything goes down and they're losing even more money because because you paid that player. So what we try to do with the Celtics is we take the same approach as, as being Calvin Wick Grossbeck, who's a great CEO run, at, and a partner and owner um, who, who run, runs the club. Basically, we've only had, I think, three coaches in 20 years and, and we've had the same general manager for 19 years until he, he, he retired. And we replaced him with the coach who was Brad Stevens. So we have continuity. So we've had the most continuity of any sports franchise and and we've had the same uh, uh, CFO and head of marketing of the whole the whole 20 years so that consistency of, of, of really having a strategy and backing the a players works if you start deviating because you were driving down the highway and they said oh, oh, oh you know the Celtics made a terrible decision they got this guy or they shouldn't get that guy and you start to listen to that that's that's when you're gonna have a problem so the media scrutiny is the big thing in sports can I be very blunt here, which is, you know, I'm sitting in the UK, I'm a big Chelsea fan, and Todd is, is getting a lot of scrutiny um, right now. My question to you is, have you had the similar scrutiny at any point in your ownership of Atlanta, of the Celtics, and, and how did you deal with it, and how would you advise other media, or sorry, other sports owners, when they are getting slammed? Well, that's a great question here, and, and uh, absolutely, we've had that. Uh, uh, it's very, I have a very vivid memory of that. And I'm trying to go back to what year that was. Uh, it was probably three years into our ownership, so 2006 or 2007. Um, one of our star players, Paul Pierce, got hurt, and he was you know 30 percent of the offense. And so we ended up losing uh, something like over 50 games that year. So we won like 30 games out of 82. The media, the fans were calling for us to fire Doc Rivers, to fire Danny Ainge, the general manager and the coach, and we had a meeting and, and we, we looked at the metrics and, and how the coaches were coaching and how Danny was doing his job. And we said, these guys are A-plus players. And so they said, there's no way, you know, there's no way we're, we're going to fire them. Then you look up, a year and a half later, we win the championship. You know, had, we, had we fired those guys, we'd be nowhere. Um, and those guys went on to be in the, fi- be in the conference finals and, and they, they, they're they two of the best people in, in the business. So, so I always remember that when there's a big headline, you know, these guys are idiots, fire the coach. Um, and I said to the media, time, we should, you know, if, 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 we, if we keep losing like this, we should fire the owners, you know, not, not, not the coach and not, not the general manager because they're, they're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Speaking of the owners, you know, we've seen over the last few years this incredible rise of bluntly USP firms and just US owners uh, into European sports organizations and franchises. Can you just help me understand, Stephen? I'm probably very naive here. Why is so much money pouring in from the U.S., both P firms and individuals, over the last few years? I think they recognized, uh, uh, it, it, it's been probably over the last 10 years, and they recognized the growth potential. I would call it the globalization of sports. Hmm. So, so, so the new media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, the ability to stream on demand, anything now, with, with streaming companies out there like Delta Tray that we've invested into, it's changed the whole landscape so that a fan can be a global fan. It used to measure fan counts in the hundreds of thousands or millions, and now they can be measured in hundreds of millions. Uh, you know, Chelsea has four or 500 million, fa- Manchester United, four or 500 million fans out there. And you're especially seeing that in the global sports, like basketball and 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 you would call it football slash, slash soccer. And that dynamic you know, has led to more revenues, giant increases in media contracts, and more value, and, and those investment firms have invested behind that successfully. Secondly, there's been a dynamic with so much money coming into the system, all what I'll call uh, artwork type assets, you know, scarce assets. Many scarce assets have, have really gone up in value because because there's a lot of money out there chasing those scarce assets. So so a component of, of the value of sports teams have been the great performance and, and the technology that's allowed it to have a bigger fan base, more monetization, higher revenues, um, and that ongoing, plus money coming into the system that's caused scarce assets to go up in value has been, been a very attractive way to invest in sports. 
I am fascinated. You said about the globalization of fans there, and totally with you, where like normally it would just be local fans who support it, and now you have, you know, Taiwanese fans who support Chelsea, and you name it. Um, my question to you is, does this not create kind of the concentration of wealth? And what I mean by that is it's like any business, especially like the creator economy of which I'm in, but like the top 1% earn 99% of the money. Do we not see that in sports, so which is like the globalization is concentrated fan bases, where Lewis Hamilton in F1, Chelsea, Real Madrid, Barcelona, and the wealth really concentrates like never before. Do you think it's like that, or is it a more even distribution? I think it's an issue, and what the organizations, the leagues have to do is really come in with, and they are doing this, come in with a set of rules to, to have competitive balance. So the real issue is competitive balance. Uh, you're you're, you're going to get that concentration if you have no competitive balance, and, and eventually that, I think, diminish the value of all the teams because, uh, you, you know, no one wants to see one team win everything, you know, every year. Uh, so, you, so you've got to have some competitive balance, and so they're putting in financial fair play rules in, in, in football. It's got, that's going the right direction. Uh, the NBA has a fantastic partnership with the players where the players are, are guaranteed half the revenues and the, and the owners get half the revenues. Uh, that's been a very successful deal because because every every time we increase revenues, the players benefit by that. So we've had very little strikes and and we've had we've had uh, uh, pretty good competitive competitive balance. But that's the key for these leagues for the long term value is to come up with systems that are fair to players and 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 and, and fair to fans, but come up allow every team to compete. You mentioned the appreciation and value of some of these kind of rare assets. You know, we're seeing some of these franchises and clubs at two billion to to six billion. Um, where does this go from here, Steve? Do you think? Like, is there still room for it to run further? Will this be twenty five billion, fifty billion dollar clubs? H how should we forecast this out? Well, it's been you know really high up into the right uh, for now. So the question is, can you go up ten times from a three billion valuation to thirty? It may be possible, but. I think they'll still have a a good run, but but you you run in, you run into this multiplier effect with that much money. Is there that much capital to buy a team? How many people can buy a team for 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 thirty billion? You run into that. that it's the same thing with artwork. You know, the, the scarcity value is is only driven by the amount of money that can come in to to buy the asset. So is is it inconceivable? No. Will it keep going up? I think it'll keep going up because there's fundamental globalization and more modernization. And more fan base being created, as long as the leagues can keep that competitive balance and keep the product exciting, and so that that's going to be the dynamic tension. Can I ask you? I view this a bit like growth investing now, which is like, yeah, the you know, inherently it's a little bit capped. You might get your three to five x if you do it well, but like the upside is capped. So is the option not go earlier? Do a Ryan Reynolds, you know, take Wrexham at whatever five million dollars, and actually, if he turns it into a billion dollar club, which he could do with his distribution channels. That's a $995 million net gain. It's pretty good. Is it not just go earlier, Steve? It's definitely, it's definitely a potential strategy. A lot of people, people are doing that. And, uh, you know, looking, looking at, at certainly the system in Europe where you can, you can buy a Division three or Division two team and move it up, there's a lot of value there. Yeah. No, I totally get you. Can I ask you, on Chelsea, uh, I am a Chelsea fan. Uh, I know you were part of the bidding process. What happened, Steve? Interviewing you, I feel really sad that you didn't buy it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a Chelsea fan. Is why I became a Chelsea fan because I spent so much time with the people there, and I loved uh, meeting uh, uh, people people representing the women's team and and the the pitch association. It was a, it was a great uh, it was a fantastic process, and I met great people in, in that process. So so I'll, I'll be I'll be a Chelsea fan uh, as as well. Chelsea was an iconic asset, and, and, and what we do with the PAX Group, which is is, is my, my sports uh, um, organization, is we want to buy iconic you know assets that have have really really like the Celtics that have a, a strong fan base that have potential to grow, and, uh, and and we view ourselves as stewards of these assets. You're really a steward. These are not you know it's not buying a company where you're trying to make more widgets. It's a company that is so ingrained in the community. So. So we, we really take a stewardship approach to this, and, and we believe good things will happen. So I really love Chelsea for that aspect. I, I had had an apartment in London, as I said, in the early days of Bain, and it was a far. We're we're at the Mayfair Place, so it's right down the road, like two two three miles down the road. So I was very excited about it, and we thought we had a great chance to win because the original RFP came out to say that they're only going to have a few groups, and they want a great steward, and they don't want any debt on the business, zero debt, which is. That's that's a that's a high hurdle, 
because you're talking about purchase prices of, of two to three billion pounds with no debt. And and we had a group that that came up with that money and what was a, a very rich price. And uh, unfortunately, at the, at the last minute, um, they went away from that model and uh, they allowed debt to debt go in the business and and they asked for a much higher price than what we were talking about. So we, we had to drop out. Hmm. Chip. And our issue was, you know, we wanted we wanted to the way we would and, and could be a very good investment, but the way we 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 do business is we want to prepare for the worst and hope hope for the best. And and we thought there'd be a big investment into the stadium. There need to be big investment into um, improvement of the facilities. We wanted to invest in players, and 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 we just determined that that at the price that it was at, it was going to be hard to make the kinds of investments that we wanted to do. That was our strategy. And the, the, the folks that bought it, their strategy could work. It may be a different strategy, but it didn't work in the context of what we were trying to accomplish. Do you regret not paying up? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, you know, because because uh, 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 <laughs> you know the, a, a piece of a piece of uh, investment advice that was given to me by by uh, uh, someone very early in my career was the only thing worse than losing a deal is doing a bad deal, and if you feel like there's not going to be the capital there. You know, you're going to struggle with it in in the plan. You probably ought to, you probably ought to back off off. So so no, I don't I don't regret that. Although it could be a very good investment. I mean, with it, it's it's an iconic franchise and and uh, and so so you know everyone has a different view of price and where their limit is and where their capital is. And and uh, you know we just felt for our strategy it didn't work. What's the hardest thing about owning a club? What is like the single biggest challenge? The politics, the you name it, the media scrutiny. What's the hardest? The, the hardest the hardest thing is is um, you know your your duty when you own a club is 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 to try to win a championship. You know I, I I'm a huge fan as well as an owner, and so I love all the players at Atalanta. I love all the players in the Celtics, and I get to know these players you know personally, and and uh, we help each other with, with various things. And then the general manager comes in and says, look. We can't win the championship unless we have a a, a better a, a new center, or uh, you know we need a striker, and then they have to trade other players or sell other players, and that's very emotional because these are people these are people you've been you, you've been friends with, and it's it's hard. Now the good news is, oh, that a lot of the Celtics is we take a lot of care in trying to take players' input, and 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 if they and, and we tell them, look, our our duty is to win here, and. And and all the players are great. So, for example, we traded Al Jefferson. He was a he was a uh, a rookie that we drafted, and I really I love the guy, and I still love him today. But he got traded for Kevin Garnett. Kevin Garnett was one of the best players in the history of the NBA. So we said we said Al, you know, we have an opportunity. They want young players. Kevin Garnett wants to come here. So it's an honor for you to be traded for one of the best players ever in the NBA. And Al went out, went on to have a great career career in Minneapolis himself. But the hardest part is, you know, having those relationships and then seeing them go to another team. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. I, I do have to ask you one final thing, which is like, you know, risk mindset is a tough one that we touched on earlier. How do you analyze your mindset to risk? Having been through all you have done with Bain, with only sports teams, how do you analyze your risk mindset today? And how has it changed over time? Well, it's changed, it's, cha it's changed a bit over time. I've always believed in being diversified. And so I'm highly diversified. I don't have a, a large burn rate in my lifestyle. So I have tolerance for more risk because I can feed my family. So but where do you spend that risk? I'm looking at things like biotech at this phase of my career. That's highly risky, but that, that can do great things for mankind. So, so our, our family office has done about over 50 biotech investments. And the game there is you, you have to do a diversified portfolio, hopefully two or three of it. My daughter-in-law, fortunately, we invested behind her. She formed a company. We're very proud of, of her. She formed a company that takes stem cells and is, is turning them into pancreatic cells to cure type 1 diabetes. And at the time when that started, that was a very risky venture six years ago. But it turns out that she's helped develop that product. She was a co-founder of the company. And now a company Vertex has just bought the company and they're building it up and it, it looks like it's worked on the first patient. So that's very gratifying to see that you can actually invest and have a good return on your money and then save lives. And so we're skewing our investment towards these riskier areas that can actually uh, be very exciting. And same thing in technology, artificial intelligence, the space world. So there's a whole area out there that, I, that, that I'm investing in now that, that I probably wouldn't have invested into, you know, unless I had a diversified base as my backup. Steve, final one before a quick fire. You have a, a very loving and successful relationship and marriage. I've learned so much from you this this interview. I'm hoping you teach me here. What are the secrets to a loving and successful marriage? 
Uh, you know, pro- probably a good, great sense of humor, number one, and, and uh, you have to have shared values. Like any partnership, you have to be willing to sacrifice for each other. And, you know, you know my wife has been amazing in terms of she was a, a, a fund manager at Fidelity and Harvard MBA, but has been taking a large responsibility for, you know, managing four kids and and, and uh, as well as do, do all the business things in biotech. So I think the key is kind of, you know, mutual respect uh, uh, and, uh, and share values. And if all else fails, a great sense of humor. Great sense of humor, absolutely crucial. Uh, we're going to do a quick fire round, Steve. So I say a short statement, you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Great. So what's the most recommended book? What should I read? What do you love? You, you might not love these books, but I, I, I love, my mother w- was a history teacher, and, uh, and so I, I love history books. So one of my favorite ones is John Adams, who was one of the founding fathers of America. And I think he's, he's the unsung you know, hero of America because he's the guy behind the scenes, a crusty old New England guy that designed the kind of the state and democratic system and the constitution. He he was the brains behind all that. He'd studied all the government civilization things from Greek and, and Locke and, and, and all the philosophies. And he came up with this checks and balances thing that worked so well for America for so many years. So so uh, it, it's amazing to learn of the intellectual firepower that he had and how he, how he really was fundamental to putting this whole country together. I love that. And I haven't had that as a suggestion before. It's by McCullough. December 2023, will we be better or worse macro-wise than we are today? You know, I'm an optimist, so I think we're going to be better. Um, I could be wrong, but I think we're going to be better. Um, uh, ho- hopefully... Uh, we'll get through. We've we've had kind of the tech bubble set in, and people are going back to basics. Employment in the U.S. is is at, at a good pace right now. Inflation is down. The big wild card is is going to be the the Russia Ukraine situation. Does that spin out of control? The polarization that's happening between nations. But hopefully, we're going to move. We we're hearing we're hearing better news out of China. Hopefully, we're going to move to their place. So I'd say we're going to be marginally better, not out of the woods, but marginally better. You mentioned you're an optimist. What are you most optimistic and hopeful for today? I'm really optimistic about uh, this current generation, uh, the, 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 the folks that we interview and, and hire into Bain Capital. They, they really have a, more of a sense of purpose that we have, maybe because we came out of this depression mentality that all we had to do was feed the family. They are driving things that we wanted to do for a long period of time. They're actually demanding and driving that. And so so the industry of private equity is trying to become more diverse. We're actually becoming more diverse now because the people you hire are demanding it. We're a better organization for that. So we're only in the early innings of that, but we've been trying to do that for years, but we're actually starting to accomplish the early stages of that. We need to invest even more, but that's going to be successful because of the belief of the people coming in. Uh, they're also concerned about the planet, uh, global warming, and, and they are much more concerned about the quality of life. People sometimes say that's a bad thing, but I think that's a good thing. The firms are responding to that. I, I find it very energizing and very optimistic, even though there's daunting challenges like global, global warming, inequality, income equality. You know, we're facing that. But you know, this generation has is, is, is really put that on, on the forefront much, much more than, so than we had done because I think we were just, our mindset was, you know, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to make sure that my family's secure. And they, they, are, they have a broader horizon and, 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 a, and a bolder vision than we do. So I'm very uplifted by that. Can I be honest? I think they're the most entitled generation. They want the salaries, they want the holidays, they want all the benefits, but actually they want, you know, the, the super nine to five work-life balance and, you know, finding oneself in Bali. Either Steve, the reason they are, I'm, I've been successful and you far, far more, because I worked seven days a week for years. I mean, I'm young, but I look old. Like, it's just about grinding. And I don't find this generation grinds like I think it is needed. Am I being unfair? Am I too old? I think you're being unfair. I I think you're being unfair. I think, I think we, you know, here I think we may have gotten the the grinding, you know, too far. Uh, uh, the the the, the uh, we the people we hire bank capital, they they work extremely hard. Uh, I think they're just much more judicious about how they use their time, and and and, and some of the grinding is not necessary. Like like some of the grinding of 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 getting the the. Uh, extra spreadsheet that 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 only relates to 0.2 percent of the business some of that some of that stuff is not so so I think these people work as hard as ever but they've made it a, a priority to be more balanced and I, I said I think that balance will be a good thing for for making judgment and investment decisions and and having a great life so I'm, I'm very optimistic about this and and uh, I see it at our company and the whole industry 
And hopefully it's going to result because we won't have a planet here unless we start focusing on on people working together to, to solve global warming, to solve income equality. We're going to have a lot of strife. So my optimism is that, that this generation is, has, uh, has really picked up on that. And they criticized the generation of the 60s as well, the one that came before me. Uh, but they made a lot of positive change on civil rights as well. But this this generation, I think, is is really committed to that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, so I feel terrible now for my critique. Um, tell me, what do you believe that most around you disbelieve? The Celtics will win the NBA championship. <laughs> I, do, I, I have no idea if that's yeah. highly probable. Well, I, no, look, it's, it, that I hope they will, but but I, I would say maybe maybe I have a big. I think people are good fundamentally. So a lot of people don't believe that, but I think people are good fundamentally and. And uh, sometimes we have to pull that out of them, but but I think people are, are good fundamentally. What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started investing? Yeah, you know, I think I learned over time in investing that that the people dimension is just as important, maybe more important than the analysis dimension. So we grew up on on the the analysis heavy culture of of uh, of, of, of of Bain Bain and Company, and we brought that over to Bain Capital. But I think we've realized over time. It's the combination of those two and the balance of those two that, that breaks success. It was, you know, Shrug, Niv, and Moshi that introduced us. What do you look for in emerging managers, Steve? Well, the first thing I look for is they, they have to have a passion for what they're investing into. And their passion has to extend to say they want to do a great job for investors. So when someone comes in with a pitch and, and, and says, uh, you know, I want to do this and I'm going to get a 20% carry, and that's the ones I shy away from. The ones that say, you know, I want to build the best set of biotech companies and I want our investors to be with me in that and co-invest with me. And and, our, and, and and if our investors do well, I'm going to do well. You know, th those are the folks that I like. I totally get you. Tell me, next five years, what are the plans? We do this show in 2028. Where will Steve Pagliuccia be then? Hopefully alive. <laughs> <laughs> you look in fine shape, my friend. Where, where, honestly, for five-year plan, what would you like? I'll always be affiliated uh, in some way with, with, with Bain Capital, helping Bain Capital. Uh, I'm going to continue to build the, the sports group, which I, which I love, and then uh, continue to invest in these areas like biotech and artificial intelligence and, and, and space um, on a venture basis where we can create great companies, but also you know leave, leave, leave a lasting impact. So I, I don't think there's ever a real point where, where I'm going to, uh, I wish I was better at golf or but, but but I'm not going to become a golf pro anytime soon. So so I, I really am curious about all these areas and love working with the people and developing the next generation. Um, there's a concept that Doc Rivers pioneered at the, that the Celtics called, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Ubuntu. And yeah. we won the championship with the Ubuntu culture in 2008. Ubuntu is, is an African word that means that you you are only here because other people have helped you get there. And so you need to help other people to get there. So we, we are all part of a system and we only succeed or fail based on how others help us. And so and so I, I think our, my, our investing, we can have a win-win. Our investing can, can actually help a lot of people. It can be fun to mentor those people and leave something of lasting impact. And that's what we want to do with Bank Capital. And that's what I'd like to do with my, my family office going forward. So hopefully I'll, I'll still be alive those five years to get that done and, and, uh, and, uh, and keep moving on. Steve, before the show, everyone just told me how humble, graceful, and elegant you are as a person. I've loved doing this. It's shows like this which make me so grateful to see what I do. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being so open and honest, and I've really loved this. 